the news agents. There's a lot of unhappiness within the Tory ranks, within the Tory cabinet, within the actual government about the state of immigration, both legal and illegal. They think the numbers are too high and they're trying to work out who to blame. What has become clear since the latest set of immigration figures were released last week, which shows that net migration, the difference between the total number of people coming and the total number of people leaving, is again at around the 700,000 mark, is that both within the cabinet, even within the Home Office and the new Home Secretary and his immigration minister, there is disagreement, there is disarray. On today's news agents, we're going to talk you through the politics of immigration and why it seems to be that despite 13 years of promises, the Conservatives seem unable or really unwilling to bring that number down. Welcome to the news agents. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And John has emigrated. We're, we're happy to contribute to the net emigration figures <laughs> ourselves on a regular basis by the fact that John Sopel yeah. almost always leaves the country every month. He's just washed up on some deserted, lovely beach. And rightly so. And rightly so. Poor boy. He does work too hard. We we're are looking s- forward to the upcoming interview with the Deputy Interior Minister of Barbados, <laughs> which will presumably come Under at some Secretary point of State this week. Yes. From the Barbudan Vital Council. Vital stuff. Yeah, we think so. Um, not to give too many clues away. So those... Immigration figures landed just the day after the Chancellor's autumn statement and the government was very much hoping that the concentration would be on tax cuts around the cuts to national insurance. And within hours of that announcement landing, it became clear that the immigration figures were pretty much off the charts. And the person who I would say was possibly the angriest of all, the person who called it a slap in the face was one Suella Bravman, who was formerly our Home Secretary. It is unclear at this point whose face was being slapped or who was, in fact, doing the slapping. If only someone could give her some responsibility and power to do something about it, we might finally get somewhere. Well, what has emerged over the past weekend, or what we are learning, is a narrative that suggests... Suella Bravman set Rishi Sunak a task of bringing down immigration with her key policy points. And he, in her words, signed up to it before he took on the mantle of Prime Minister. And I think this is important in the sense of taking us back to a place where you could tell that the splits in the Tory party over immigration are not brand new. They go back Well, I mean, we know that they go back sort of many years, but in this particular iteration, they probably go back to the point at which Rishi Sunak was about to become prime minister, didn't really want to appoint Suella Bravman, we've talked about that before, but felt he had to to get the numbers. And she, according to her version of events, made him sign up to a sort of her own five point plan, if you like, which was about demanding higher salaries from those coming in, demanding whether or not they were allowed to bring dependents if immigrants came in. And he, in her words, just railroaded through this. And why I think this is important now is because there is a lot of mud slinging. They are all slinging mud at each other and they're all on a slightly different place when it comes to what should be done. Yeah, they are. And that has emerged even over the course of the last week with Braverman's successor, who is, of course, uh, James Cleverley, the former Foreign Secretary. I mean, there is already an enormous enormous amount of unhappiness on the Tory backbenches about the 700,000 or so net migration figure which came out, which follows basically the same sort of figure as the year before. Uh, Huge, huge irritation, political concern as well, because they feel that this is a party that not only once famously pledged to get net migration down to the tens of thousands under David Cameron, now back in the government, of course, but also who, which predicated and believed in a vision of Brexit, which was in some way anchored around the idea of, yes, take back control, but most people interpreted that as not just take back control and keep the numbers high or indeed much higher. Bear in mind that back in 2016, net migration was only around 200, 250,000. Now it's at 700,000. And they are saying, look, if we go into the next general election, as it looks like we're now bound to with figures of this sort of number, we're going to get absolutely slaughtered. And step into that, James Cleverly, the new Home Secretary, giving an interview to The Times this weekend, where he appeared to, as we have said that, he probably would when he was appointed. He appeared to resile from many of the sort of key 
elements of the kind of Braverman prospectus on immigration and indeed change of tone. He had a change of tone. So he was saying, for example, that he wouldn't really countenance leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. He was saying that he uh, thought Rwanda was important, but it was only part of the plan. And we get far too fixated. And of course, we ourselves are kind of falling into the trap even having this discussion because, of course, Rwanda and the ECHR only relates to illegal migration, so-called, i.e. small boats, irregular arrivals, which is a tiny, tiny proportion. I mean, we should actually go into that because if you're looking at figures of around 700 and 745 thousand in terms of net overall migration, the small boats number sits at around 40,000. So that is, what, 7%? Less than 1 in 10? And so all this concentration on stopping the boats, stopping the boats, stopping the boats, does not even touch the sides of the massive numbers that are coming in under the government's own schemes. And there'll be lots of people, I think we should also say, who actually say, well, those numbers are a result of things that our economy needs, whether it's workers in social care, whether it's students at the university, you know, James Clevey said again, we have a world-class education system, whether it's our humanitarian um, contributions and responsibilities to people from Hong Kong and Afghanistan and Ukraine. So, I mean, there's also this whole consideration within the legal numbers of migration of, of whether we, A, want those people and B, need those people to actually make our economy function better. Totally. And that had generates its own political problems. The illegal or irregular migration, i.e. people claiming asylum, not exclusively, although largely uh, from across the channel, um, is something which is probably even more politically contentious just because it so uh, riles so many people on the Tory benches. And the idea of there being a move away from the Braverman rhetoric on Rwanda, which we should say, I mean, didn't achieve anything. I mean, like, you know, we've seen the Rwanda plan, which she oversaw, went down in flames at the Supreme Court. But nonetheless, we can see why, in a way, she was a use- useful shock absorber they, they for say, Sunak. They would say, actually, it did achieve something, which was that it worked as a deterrent. We don't yet know if that's true, but they would say that even the spectre of the well, Rwanda plan did work to some degree as a deterrent by putting off people from coming here who might otherwise have made well, that given, journey. Maybe, but I mean, given the numbers are, are you yeah, know, they're down a bit, but yeah. not down substantially. I mean, who knows? But the point is, as well, is that you are um, even seeing, you know, so we've got this split now between cleverly and at least some of the in the Tory party backbenches. There is even this suggestion of a split within the Home Office itself between Cleverly and his Minister of Immigration, Robert Jenrick, who has been Very a much signed over. up to the Suella... Indeed. Suella I mean, funnily enough, I mean, Jenrick was sort of put there to kind of keep an eye on Suella Braverman by Rishi Sunak as a close ally, but he appears to have gone pretty hard line on a lot of these matters. And indeed, at the weekend, there was also this suggestion that he was basically putting out there his own ideas for how to reduce numbers, which were a bit like so the Braverman's ideas. So, you know, you, as you say, Emily, you know, you increase the salary threshold to come in, other things as well. But again, this is kind of disintegration as well, dis- disarray, because like, since when does the immigration minister have his own personal ideas that he's just sort of putting out there that he'd quite like to see? He is the immigration minister. Mm. He's bound by collective responsibility. And you could see it in the House of Commons today. It was Home Office questions. James Cleverley's first uh, Home Office questions as uh, Home Secretary. And Stephen Kinnock, who is a Labour shadow Home Office Minister, decided to have some fun with this idea of a split even within the Home Office. Shadow Minister Stephen Kinnock. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Speaker, since the previous Home Secretary was removed from her post, I think it's fair to say that the Immigration Minister has become a law unto himself. First, he briefed the media that he's been instructing the Prime Minister to tear up all our legal obligations in order to fix the unfixable Rwanda policy. Then he set himself on a collision course with his new Home Secretary by appearing to bet the House on the Rwanda flight taking off. And to add insult to injury, he went behind his new boss's back to present his laundry list to the Prime Minister, including a cap on social care visas and abolishing the shortage occupation. Does the Immigration Minister have any respect whatsoever for the authority of the new Home Secretary? And given if he, that he's said to be on resignation watch, can he confirm that he will resign if his pro- proposals are rejected? Yeah. Well, 
once again, we heard absolutely nothing, nothing. from the benches nothing. opposite about what they would actually nothing. do. The, the sad truth is they have complete disdain for the British public. They do not appreciate that the public that we're sent here to represent want us, demand that we reduce the levels of both legal and illegal migration. The Home Secretary and I will do absolutely everything in our power to achieve that. We're working closely with the Prime Minister and we'll be setting out further plans in due course. But the public watching this debate should be very clear. If they share our determination to tackle small boats or to reduce the numbers arriving in this country legally, they only have the Conservative Party to support. So there is not a mention, he doesn't fall into the connect trap of responding to the idea of splits. What he's doing is setting up for Labour the sense that they haven't got an answer to immigration. And I think the truth is that what you won't hear from Labour is any reference to an idea that immigration isn't too high. I think you will you will hear from Labour the same sense as from the Conservatives that immigration needs to be controlled, that you cannot have untethered, unsustainable numbers of people coming to this country. And yet it's quite interesting that Phil Collins is making the, the point today that the question of immigration perhaps has much less to do with immigrants and much more to do with the function of the labour market, and in particular, he says, the demand for workers in social care. And that is where we are at the moment, that the government is having to wave in cheap labour. Don't forget that immigrants, in the sort of weird irony, can get paid at a lesser rate if they are fulfilling roles that employers cannot fill with sort of homegrown domestic um, talent or workforce. And that they do not, we do not have the money to train up inexperienced local workforces. So actually, this idea is much more complicated than the government is letting you know, which is that they need the very people that they also are talking about rejecting. They need them to keep the labour market going. This is one of the problems, right, with with this debate, which is that... Look, I think we can recognise that uh, this is an extraordinary number. I mean, 700,000 net migration is like something that we we haven't seen before. That sort well, of it's rate. three times higher than it was pre-Brexit. Quite. And it is an extraordinary ask of British infrastructure and resources to be able to absorb, not least when we have a significant housing crisis. That said, whenever we have this debate, it very re- rarely goes beyond the superficial, right? So it's very, very easy to come along and say, we've got to get this number down. Yeah. And then you say, OK, so where should we start? Is it with students? Well, students, international students, very, very good for, in fact, vital for our higher education system. For actually putting Um, the money into the coffers that they so desperately need. Quite so, because you charge them more. Um, And uh, so we're going to crack down on some of their dependents. Well, that could be difficult because you don't want to make Britain less competitive for, you know, graduate students and PhD students and so on. Okay, so you want to... Reduce the number of social care workers or NHS staff or or, fruit pickers or or, or seasonal seasonal labour market. Exactly. And so as soon as you start to get into uh, the actual specifics, everything starts to become much more hazy. And that's because in a way, I mean, one way to think of, of, of migration is that it probably, at least to some extent, sometimes reflects policy failure elsewhere. It's plugging a gap which exists, which in some cases... If we take students out, for example, if we're talking about the labour yeah. market, well, probably ought not to exist. So, for example, um, we've got a lot of people who could be in work, who aren't in work or who don't want to do exactly. the jobs that we are now inviting other people into. So do. we have got two and a half million people who are now economically inactive. Uh, we've got a growing number of people who are on sickness related benefits and sickness and are have left the labour market as a result of ill health and uh, sickness. It's something that we saw last week. The Chancellor is concerned about. The thing is with that is that uh, it takes time. It takes quite a long time. Yeah, we we must get the economic inactivity rate down over the long term. We must. But it does take a long time. One reason, one thing that we haven't heard over the course of the last week, and this is another sense in which immigration represents a kind of policy failure or lapse, is that what is one of the reasons why so many people end up at the moment, why that economic inactivity rate is going up, why people are leaving the labour force due to ill health, we often hear from some newspapers and so on and and some politicians talking about people, you know, uh, not wanting to work as a result of the pandemic or become lazy. Maybe there are some people like that. One of the big factors we hear less about from the government, of course, is the fact there are a lot of people 
waiting on an NHS waiting list well, this is the because labor, they the, are so high. Yeah. If you've got this is the a, Labour argument all the way through that when the government talks about getting people back to work and taking away benefits, Labour says, well, all you need to do actually is attack your NHS waiting it, list, and you will find people in better health are more able to. Get it's back not to the work. whole answer, but it's part of the answer. Right. And you know, if you've got say a back injury or a back problem, and then you're looking to get a sort of minor procedure, or it wouldn't be minor, feel minor to you, but an elective procedure in an NHS hospital, but it keeps being pushed back and it keeps being pushed back for one reason or another or you've got a long waiting list what are you supposed to do yeah. and and this is the thing and so it's not the, this is what I mean these are policy failures which will take a long time to address and in that their place comes immigration because we have got a pretty still even despite the economy not be, being you know relatively stagnant and so on we've got a pretty hot labour market a tight labour market and firms are still crying out for labour I think both labour and the Tories are reaching for political arguments that actually don't entirely tally with reality. Yes, there will be people who, you know, would be able to return to work if they weren't waiting for an operation on the NHS. Yes, there are some people who do need to be encouraged back into work and need to rely less on benefits. But overall, the people that are coming to this country actually are doing jobs that we probably never did yeah. ourselves, right? We probably don't have enough trained social care workers for an ageing population, right? So it's not like all the people that are sitting at home would automatically be working in social care or fruit picking. I don't think we ever had that market because we did rely on it. In a, in a pre-Brexit age, we did rely on that external labour coming in. And whatever the need to sort of, you know, train people up, we haven't done it yet. We haven't been able to do it yet. And that is still plugging the gap in, for us, what is an ageing population. Yeah, and uh, if we take a longer view, um, by the way, we probably are going to over the longer term have to get accustomed or get used to higher levels of migration than we were used to before it might not be this high but we know that as a result of the population pyramid we have we know as a result of declining fertility rates we know part of this century is going to be a hunt for population certainly for the older continents like north america and europe in particular we've seen a sort of foresight of it in japan in countries like japan and i suppose what i worry about in a way in terms of a slightly bigger thing in terms of this particular debate and how corrosive and toxic it is for our politics overall which is that again worth saying can totally understand why many people will be concerned about immigration levels at this figures at these sort of figures there are really legitimate questions to be asked about and a legitimate debate to be had not that we ever not have that debate by the way everyone's always like we need a debate about migration we, don't have the we debate. never ever stop I think having that's it. right but yeah we never we ever stop well yes but the thing is what we don't have is an honest debate and it's not in the way that people mean often when certain figures say that. My worry is this, is that we've had 13 years, actually, and longer, because Labour used to did it as well in government and probably will again when they get into government, if they do, of politicians coming along every single year and saying, we've got to stop, we've got to reduce migration from this figure, from this relatively arbitrary figure. And they never, ever, as we've just done, then say the next clause or the next sentence, which is, and that will mean X, and that will mean Y, or that will mean Z. And most of them are clever, and most of them know that, but they're not willing to interject or inject mm. that level of complexity into the debate. So all the public hears and sees are politicians who come along and they say, we must do this, we must reduce immigration numbers, and then it doesn't happen, for good reasons. Yeah. And what effect does that have? It is corrosive on our politics, I, because it basically makes po democratic politics look useless and feeble and unable to take action. And guess who steps in to the gap there? Yeah. Well, you get the populists, you get demagogues, you I, get people who offer simple answers. And our democratic, more sensible politicians need to be the ones to inject a little bit of complexity and just level with the public, yeah, be I honest think, with them. I think until you actually have that debate and until you actually talk about trade-offs the trade-offs the costs and the and the pluses and minuses you're basically opening the door for the farageification of the conservative party you know if if that even you know needs to go any further because it's very easy for reform or very easy for the Brexit party or very easy for Farage to step in and say, the Conservatives promised you this, they're not delivering, come to us. If the Conservatives turn round to Farage and had the conversation that we're having, which is like, what do you want to see happen now? If you put up the minimum salary requirement, you will get fewer people coming in. You will have fewer people working in social care in this country. You will have more elderly without care in local government communities. Is that what you want? Right? Is that the trade-off that you're prepared to see? If so, let's say it. Everyone's just talking about <laughs> being slapped in the face, even if they were actually at the heart of government. And that's how you end up with this 
debate at the moment which has a kind of surreal quality and air to it, which is government ministers almost talking about immigration like it's the weather, like it's something that is sort of slightly beyond my control. It's like, oh, God, it's this guy's really cloudy today, isn't it? Oh, that rain's coming. God, whoa, we'll try and do something about that tomorrow. But everybody knows that it won't happen and that it can't happen. And everybody knows that it could happen. But and they say that it's going to. But really, they know they're not. And that is what I think is corrosive. In a moment, New Zealand's just worked out that their smoking ban idea is too expensive. They've ditched it. Will we? Now, today sees a brand new government in New Zealand. Are we going far for our news? Well, in one respect, (laughs) maybe we are. But in another, it's quite relevant because the new government... Very, very far away from the Jacinda Ardern years. Jacinda Ardern uh, left as Prime Minister several months ago. But this guy who's come in, Christopher Luxon, is Conservative, is fairly right wing and has decided on day one to repeal a ban on smoking which was kind of the blueprint for where Rishi Sunak took his. And this was something that had been introduced on the Ardern government um, about 11 months ago. And he has now come in and said, in simple terms, it costs too much well, costs to get too, rid of the tax. Well, he says it costs too much and it's not conservative. Right. He wants to maximise individual choice. And he also said that it would have led to a black market in cigarettes. So just to, to remind people, this is this is the policy that has been almost completely lifted by, from, by Rishi Sunak, which isn't a, an outright ban on cigarettes, but it's, it's, it's a staged prohibition on cigarettes. It's a year by year yeah. raising of the age so that if you're 14 today, you will never ever be legally allowed to buy a cigarette. Yes, which of course I mean, I suppose it wouldn't mean for us, but I'm looking forward to like when they change, you know, behind the sort of news agents, as it were, counter uh, and it says like, you know under 18 or challenge 21. I'm looking forward to that slowly going under up 64. over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. challenge 65. <laughs> exactly. Challenge 70. What does this mean for us, by the yeah, way? The you news always agents. need an older brother. How are we going to How are we going to fund ourselves at the news agents without the without, without all the, the yeah? It's difficult. But I think isn't it, it is really interesting because I guess everyone is now looking to Rishi Sunak's government and saying, "Are you getting cold feet?" If you've just seen what happened 11 months into this policy in New Zealand, which was they suddenly turned around and said, "Actually, we." We don't really like people dying, but we really do like the tax revenues that come from cigarettes. Is that going to happen I here? don't think that was on the slogan. I don't think that was in Not the manifesto. Not originally, was it? <laughs> Not in the manifesto. <laughs> so we don't like people dying, but we do like the tax revenue. <laughs> but, it, but I guess it does all go back to NHS spending, right? Which is the ultimate irony, which is you can't afford to keep your spending on NHS without the tax revenues. And some of the tax revenues are coming literally from selling products to people that are making them ill enough to have to go to the NHS. But I think it is going to be interesting, actually, what whether this is brought up, and I'm sure it will be, by certain members of the Conservative Parliamentary Party uh, the back, on the backbenches who did not like this policy when it was announced at party conference. I mean, it was one of the kind of show, along with sort of cancelling HS2, it was kind of that weird narrative that Sunak had for about 10 minutes where he was sort of showing all unchanged, the tough decisions that, yep. that he was going to make in a way that 30 years of previous governments hadn't made. And that's why I'm going to ban smoking, you know, for children, which was a sort of weird conceptual leap. But it's going to be interesting to see whether the fact that New Zealand has retreated from it and the government, you know, pointed that it was basically going to be the same scheme and it had been trialled there and so on, um, has a political impact on this one, on, on Sunak's policy, because there are lots of Conservative MPs who do not like it. They think that it is unconservative. They think they shouldn't be in the business of banning things. They think they shouldn't be in the business of telling people how to live their lives and have a pro- having a prohibition on individual choice. Sunak's argument is that, and, and they also deploy the argument, which is to say that if it starts here, where does it end? Sunak's argument is, well, smoking is kind of unique because there is no healthy amount of smoking. Yeah, but I you mean... can understand why if you are, and I've actually got some sympathy with this, if you are slightly more liberally minded, I can understand how you would be concerned about it. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I hear that. I hear the conservative, you know, I don't, we don't like banning things perspective. But actually, I think we forget how many times the state does intervene they ban drugs. in our lives. They ban all the drugs. They make you wear they a seatbelt. You know, back in the 1980s, there were people going, oh, uh, why do I have to wear a seatbelt just to save my life and my family's life? You know what? People got used to that pretty quickly. They all did speak like that, obviously. Yeah. You know, every yeah. single one. I mean, I was, I was but, only alive for six months of the 80s, but so I'll have to take your word I for it. I think it was the 80s. Yeah. Anyway, there was that... Well, hey. actually, maybe it was earlier. I mean... 
you know, I won't go into clunk click, but there was definitely a campaign. Oh, what, the seatbelts in the seventies? Right. That was Barbara Castle, yeah, right, yeah, exactly, yeah. to get people to wear to wear seatbelts. So. We also had a problem for about five minutes with not smoking indoors. And then we kind of got over that because we realised that actually if people are, you know, waiting tables, all the rest of it, it'd be quite nice for them not to have to have smoke breathed into their lungs the whole night. We also complained for about five minutes about taking plastic bags with us to go shopping. And now it just seems really obvious and really simple. George Osborne, of all people, you know, Mr Austerity, put a tax on sugar in fizzy drinks, in, in kind of soft soft drinks. So I think we're kind of kidding ourselves if we think that the government, even a Conservative government, doesn't intervene, yeah. right? I mean, of course it does. There are, there are very many status measures that we've just got used to. Yeah. And look, they ban things all the time. All governments do because, you know, if you are the state... By definition, you act in a statist way quite a lot of the time, and it was all a matter of degree. Right. I think there is, but I do think there is a there is a legitimate argument to be had about whether this is the right intervention to make. It kind of came from nowhere. It wasn't something well, along that with was. A-levels. Yeah, indeed. Oh, yeah, that's the other thing. That was the other thing that showed how sort of he was taking on the established wisdom by proposing to change the A level results in England, uh, A level system in England in the twenty thirties, and and you, know, you got the slight sense uh, that this was a prime minister and a political figure sort of hunting and searching for a legacy yeah. who knew that his time was probably going to be limited and this would be something that he would be able to point to i'm sort of up for that i mean i think yeah, you know like, if you're but, going to point to if you if you need a legacy i prefer to have a smoking ban than a statue quite frankly yes yes i suppose that's true but i mean on the other hand like what is the my sort of point is is that there is there is a sense it in a way, I'm, I'm not as so bothered about the policy. I mean, my own instinct actually is, is I don't particularly feel that comfortable with just deciding to ban something on an age basis. Well, you don't it's mind, a bit odd. To be honest, you don't mind them banning asbestos from schools. I don't see people running yeah, around but going, I mean, asbestos... well, it's our choice to have asbestos well, I know, but have, you, have you ever smoked asbestos? I mean, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't but my fancy... Point is that if somebody actually removes cigarettes that yeah, literally but... have no benefit except for killing you, yeah, right? but, but why it's is a... that any different to having asbestos? Well, in, in your a weird sort of, your I mean, in a weird sort of way, I actually sort of think you might have given the way that the state. It's a slightly more intellectually honest position than the sort of position we have got to with cigarettes, which is almost to kind of make them almost completely illicit. You know, you can't sort of put them on display. You can't like you can't even have packaging for them. It's you have meant to, have to be pictures. nudge. You have isn't pictures it? of like diseased lung. lungs. Yeah. So you know, in a way, at least you might as well go the the whole way. But there is ten billion of revenue that you generate from them, and I actually just generally think that we have. As a society, and I think this has been particularly so since the pandemic, something I hated most about the pandemic was, and it was necessary to a large extent for certain, uh, that particular time, but we've got quite used, I think, in some ways to outsourcing our judgment to the state and for the state to constantly sort of tell us what to do. And yes, you're right, the state does tell us what to do and bans things and sets the limits in all sorts of ways. I'm just not particularly keen that that is extended even yet further. And although the slippery slope argument is, you know, can be a kind of limited one, I do sort of slightly worry about the sort of precedence it says because I'm not entirely sure. Sunak's argument is there's no healthy amount of smoking. Is there that much healthy amount of alcohol? Is there that much healthy amount of fat or sure, whatever it happens to be? You know, you can see the extension of the argument by a government that might be less yep. liberal, I less can, libertarian I, I see over that. time. I just think um, the slippery slope is never that slopey or that slippery. I mean, generally, things do not progress to the next stage. I, I, I know that sounds like a huge Well, except it has with smoking, because I remember when, even when you could argue with the, in 2007, when the uh, indoor smoking ban was introduced, people said, oh, well, next they'll be banning cigarettes. And people were like, no, it won't. And yet, indeed, that is right. where we are. So okay. in this sense, the, sli- the slope was st- quite slippery. Yeah, it's st- but it's still just talking about cigarettes. I mean, we have basically, in a way, the extraordinary thing is we haven't done it earlier. I think once you've got people saying your lungs will be poisoned and cancerous and here's a picture of what they'll look like. It's kind of, it's almost extraordinary that we haven't stepped in earlier to say, sod the £10 billion of revenue, we'd actually prefer to keep our our citizens alive. I mean, I think you can go both ways. Yes, of course, you know, it is an infringement on our personal liberties. Do our personal liberties get infringed the whole time? Yes. Would it be better if they banned things that were actively harming us and costing us and and putting a huge, huge um, drain on our health resources to banning something that actually kept more people alive and, and flourishing? Yes. I mean, I would just say that the history of the state banning narcotics has not been a particularly successful one. I mean, whether we look to prohibition itself in the United States or whether we look to the endless war on drugs, the pro the state deciding what narcotics people can consume has generally speaking led to 
problems. Sure. And, and, I'm then, not you saying at, and that, then you look at all the, you know, liberalisation, all the states in the US yeah. that do now sell drugs, you know, freely and easily. And actually, there are a lot of places that people do not want to live yeah, because yeah. they are yeah, so druggy yes. and they are so, you know, yep. yes, it's legal. Right, yeah. but and actually, Amsterdam and cannabis have tried to withdraw from it. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's a difficult uh, balance to strike. I just sort of think, given the state, the sta- the state's lack of ability to control the narcotics that it does prescribe. Okay, not entirely sure a... we should expand it even further. Let's let's have a bet because that's what we want to do. Yeah, we love a show. bit of gambling we on the show, don't we? Gambling, yeah. Basically, the tote in here. Do now. you think a Rishi Sunak will cave in because he'll lose his will? B he will hand the policy over to Keir Starmer and Keir Starmer will what? Cave in or go with it? I think Starmer will go for it. I mean, Streeting's committed to it now. So it looks like it's now achieved a kind of cross-party consensus on it. In fact, Streeting had said to Shadow Health Secretary that it was something that he would... He See, would I think that's quite grown up. If, I think if we were the first country in the world to ban smoking... Sorry, New Zealand. Yeah, I think that'd be quite a good legacy. Right, Emily, I've got a mystery for you. <laughs> I love a mystery. I know you do, right? Has it got a little bit of the old Ecule Poirot? Uh, well, of course, exactly. You are my Miss Lemon. Uh, no, who am I kidding? I'm Miss Lemon. Anyway, it's the case of the missing 28 billion, right? Mm. Labour's 28 billion, which is basically, as we were saying last week, as things stand now, going to probably be the centrepiece of the Conservative election campaign. It's a £28 billion that Labour initially said they were going to spend per year on green energy, on revolutionising the energy grid, and so on, green investments to get to net zero. Then Rachel Reeve changed that to £28 billion a year by the end of the Parliament. And there was a really weird thing that happened this weekend where the BBC and the Telegraph ran with a story which said that there was going to be a further dilution of the 28 billion that they had spoken to a source close to Keir Starmer or in Keir Starmer's office who said that they wanted to dilute that 28 billion further Mm. because they are worried and I definitely know this to be true there are people around Starmer and in Reeve's team who are worried who can see what's coming down the track and think that the Tories are going to try and do a 1992 Labour tax bombshell campaign on the 28 billion something that we've talked about before what was weird about that is that I saw that sort of story on Saturday morning and no sooner had 10 minutes passed than someone got in touch with me from the Labour Party saying, you need to get a line on this because it's just not true. And so I got in touch with, with someone, a uh, Labour source, and they did indeed give me a line on it. And they said this, a Labour Party spokesperson has denied the Telegraph story that Keir Starmer has asked for £28 billion to be watered down, saying it was categorically untrue. Although our policies are subject to our fiscal rules, the position on the Green Prosperity Plan was unchanged. Labour will ramp up investment in jobs and energy independence through our Green Prosperity Plan to a total of £28 billion a year, as planned in the second half of the Parliament. Meanwhile, BBC and The Telegraph not retreating from their story. Yeah, I think Labour's got into a bit of a pickle on this one. Yeah. Because I think, I mean, clearly, the idea at the beginning was meant to be a kind of copying, copy and paste as far as they could of what Joe Biden was doing with his Inflation Reduction Act. This is going to be £28 billion, just to clarify, not of just borrowing, but of borrowing to invest, particularly in green jobs, in green energy, all the rest of it. And I was told about six months ago that actually the stupidest thing that Labour could do was tout around this figure early. It's the kind of thing you do after you've won an election. They said, you don't start telling people how much you're going to spend, particularly when the Conservatives are fixated fixated still, like 10 years on, 15 years on, on that Liam Byrne note, which says there's no money left. But I think what's happened is every time Labour's tried to sort of push this further or dilute it, they've slightly muddled their messaging. Because at the weekend, Darren Jones, Labour's sort of Chief Secretary of the Treasury, said that the £28 billion would come in in the next Parliament, whereas the Reeves figure from last summer was it would come in towards the end of the first Parliament. And I think that they're sort of, they're putting so many caveats on it, whether it's going to be, is it the end of this parliament? Is it going to be the next parliament? Is it only going to be introduced if national debt was falling as a percentage of the size of the economy? They now look scared of the very policy that at one point they wanted to make their centrepiece. And I think that that speaks volumes to the Conservatives having tapped into something that Labour's really nervous about. Because otherwise they'd just, they'd just come out and they'd just be much more sure-footed about it. So I think it's a reflection of, of a few things. I think that these competing stories, narratives, and, and we should say again, you know, the official Labour Party position 
as we understand it, has not changed. The 28 billion is still intact as per what they said to me at the weekend. But it is clear that there is concern about it. We've talked about that on the show. There is concern about what the Conservatives might do with it. There's concern from some that it's a sort of, as Linton Crosby, the Conservative strategist, would have put it, a barnacle on the boat that could come to dominate an election campaign. And there's something else going on as well, which is, I think, actually, in fairness, one thing this is reflective of, which isn't spoken about a lot, but which is part of the dynamic, is that uh, Ed Miliband and his team, they got in there early with this stuff. They had a... Miliband knows the territory. As in environmental... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so when the Labour Party... They got the Labour Party to commit to this some time ago. And there are other parts of the shadow cabinet and in the Labour leadership who are suddenly thinking, well, hang on, Mm -hmm. having committed to that, having played a really good game, they're now thinking, hang on a minute, well, if we're spending £28 a year by the end of the Parliament on that, how much money, given how fiscally constrained we're going to be particularly after last week absolutely with jeremy hunt's where we know departmental that departmental spending expenditure limits are will so not be protected tight, yeah. so tight what's going to be left for everything else yeah. and in particular when you consider of course as well that although the labor party has put itself has a self-imposed target of uh, making the energy grid 100 percent clean energy uh, and so on you could argue you could say and it's really important you could say the thing that is going to be most important for determining a Labour government's fortunes, i.e. whether it's going to be re-elected in that Mm. first term, frankly, is whether public services actually show signs of recovery. If the NHS waiting list do come down, if schools start to appear to be less pressured than they are at the moment, if all that we see in terms of this narrative of... NHS waiting list... Totally. If if this narrative of Britain... If Britain is falling apart now, if that is a key narrative going into the general election campaign... Obviously, the key test for a Labour government is, have they fixed it? Is Britain still falling apart? Yeah, I mean, I and, think... And maybe the green energy stuff, as important as it is, doesn't play into that. Well, and that is well part it, of it the... plays into a Sunlit Uplands where you yeah. are trying to do great things to transform a country, which is, I think, what Labour was saying in November 2021. Before, <laughs> if we can take you know, our listeners back, before Owen Patterson Gate, before the first of the sort of, let's call them lobbying sleaze crisis, which would eventually lead to the downfall of Boris Johnson after Partygate, after Pinchergate, after all the other um, sort of exposés that we saw of that Prime Minister and how he dealt with sort of scandals and crises in his government at the time. I don't think Labour were expecting him to disappear six months later. You know, I mean, yes, the, the, the election will probably end up being at the same point. But at one point remember they were thinking that Boris Johnson had not only the rest of this parliament but quite possibly another parliament too before anyone was looking at Labour and that all got massively sped up so I think the 28 billion did belong to that sort of time when they could come out and say things that were very aspirational and very optimistic and definitely appealed to young voters who wanted to hear you know big expenditure on green policies on environmental policies on jobs all the rest of it and now they're getting stuck in exactly this trap, which is, are you going to be the party of lavish spending? Which is exactly how the Conservatives want to portray Labour because it worked so well last time round in 2010. Well, it was also uh, a commitment made at a time when money um, was still was cheaper than it is now, when we were still in the kind of dying yeah. embers of the period of cheap money, yeah. which car- which was one of the dominant features of our politics and characteristics of our politics for the last 10 years that all came to an end in the after in the last sort of 12 to 18 months or so as central bank interest rates around the world started to climb and before we knew just how fiscally constrained a any government coming in now is going to be unless you are willing to consider more radical ways of raising revenue like wealth taxation which Rachel Reeves has said that that she isn't i mean the, the flip side to it though is this and and you sort of alluded to this emily is that there there will be and would be a cost to retreat from it now and if you talk to labor people they'll point this out and i think it is true which is that one of Starmer's weaknesses, and this comes out in all the focus groups and, and polling and so on, his weaknesses with the public is that they perceive him to be vacillating. They perceive him to sometimes not appear to know what he stands for. That he'll just sort of say anything to be elected. I always think that's a bit of a weird criticism because he's leader of the opposition. That's kind of what he has to do. But that is that is one of his problems. So if he were now to retreat even further from what has been one of the key, if mm. not perhaps the key, mm. defining pledge of his leadership so far, certainly the biggest policy pledge, that's a problem. And the other weakness, you could say, is that 
he's a man and has a leadership which is, although competent and although, you know, you can say he looks the part and he would be able to be prime minister, has kind of lacked a sense of kind of defining mission or zeal. And yeah. this would be it. I mean, to actually achieve, as when I was talking to him a couple of Fridays ago, to actually achieve just the clean energy mission that he has of getting Britain 100% clean energy by 2030 would be absolutely would be massive. massive. And many I, people don't think it's possible. Yeah, I mean, all the discussion over the weekend of whether Rishi Sunak um, would or wouldn't bring forward a general election seemed to hinge around this number that doesn't normally exist in polling at around this time, the electoral cycle, which is the undecideds, a large number of undecideds, 20%, which Rishi Sunak sees as a plus, right? Oh, great, they're undecided, I can win them over. But I guess that also speaks to a nervousness in the Labour camp, which is Labour's camp, rather, um, you know, of what what are they what are they undecided about? Are they undecided because I'm not being radically spendy enough? Or are they undecided because they are kind of traditional Tory voters who are a bit sick of the Conservatives, but actually don't want to see anything that looks fiscally imprudent? And so I think Keir Starmer is right now sort of one foot in each camp because he wants to give one message to younger voters and to energise the sort of the dynamic people, you know, the dynamic voter who wants to see change. And the other foot is in the sort of reassurance campaign, which is like, I'm not scary. Don't try and make me out to be, you know, scary. Do you remember all those um, Tory, I think it was MNC Saatchi campaigns of... New Labour, New Danger. Yes. In 97. Uh, Blair they, appeared with devil eyes. eyes. Yeah. And actually, I think, I mean, it didn't work, not in electoral no. <laughs> terms. And it was a kind of weird, very personal poster. Um, but I think that is the best strategy that the Conservatives have, time and again, is to worry people about Labour as a danger. And what they mean is an overspending, unthinking, careless with your money danger. And so, of course, Samra's now probably sort of slightly, you know, hedging his bets on how close to the end of the parliament or the beginning of the next parliament he wants to land this 28 billion. The main thing about John being on holiday, of course, is that, again, yeah, and he needed the break, so, so it is he important. He did need the yeah. break. It had been at least 21 exhausting, days. Exhausting. Uh, it is exhausting. So, uh, but I suppose in a way, he is he is just returning to his roots, right? Because... I mean, Barbados, I suppose, is, is in North America. All, yeah. And he I mean, was the North in America the editor. Seas around yeah. Barbados. He's keeping an eye on North America for us. I think week. he is. Yeah. yeah. A very close eye. Yeah. And he'll be on the news agents USA. News he USA, will. USA and Caribbean <laughs> edition. USA and Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm actually quite up for that, actually, if we want to do a spin off. <laughs> yeah, you got the gig. See you in Trinidad. Bye. Bye bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 